by simply engaging in verbal discourse, one implicitly agrees to a set of rules and guidelines, even more so when one engages in argument. After all, if people don't agree, they can just not engage in an argument. For example, the act of arguing implies acknowledging the other person is acting purposefully, that the one you are engaging in discourse with is capable of changing their mind when presented with new, truthful information. Hopp took this and concluded there is some connection between libertarian ethics and rational discourse. He concluded that rejecting libertarian ethics in argumentation, specifically rejecting self-ownership, is a performative contradiction, that is, a statement that is proven false by the act of articulating it. For example, one cannot argue, or I do not exist, are also performative contradictions. Hopp presents it as the following. 1. Valid propositions can only arise from argumentation. 2. Any proposition that fails to respect the preconditions of argumentation cannot be justified through argumentation. 3. Argumentation can only occur if all participants have exclusive control over their bodies, i.e. self-ownership. 4. Denying self-ownership is denial of the speaker's own ability to put forward the argument denying self-ownership. 5. Denying self-ownership is a performative contradiction and therefore a false statement. For example, a thief does not validate his actions through argumentation, their actions being independent of the choices or preferences of the other party after all. They just steal what they want. The absence of this ability to validate theft or rape or kidnapping or murder through argumentation is a demonstration of their non-validity, unlike free trade which is negotiated through argumentation and either agreed upon or refused. From this framework, Hobb claims a rational, value-free proof of libertarian ethics from which to derive the principle of self-ownership. Hopp compares this to other libertarian philosophical traditions. He calls it the ultimate refutation of utilitarian libertarianism. Simply making utilitarian arguments presupposes self-ownership as true, something utilitarians would otherwise reject, as philosophical utilitarianism judges validity on the outcome rather than consistency. Similarly to consequentialists, the veracity of argumentation ethics is completely independent of and prior to outcomes. Consistency therefore demands consequentialists be held in suspended animation as the outcomes determine their capacity for human action. In the absence of this, Hopp calls that a position of praxeological absurdity. On natural rights, Hopp claims that argumentation ethics supports its conclusion completely, being an add-on that provides a universal, irrefutable proof that is consistent and regardless of human nature, and bridging the is-ought gap, aka Hume's guillotine. Hopp bypasses this by creating value-free statements that never leave the realm of factual is statements, and provides a basis for conflict resolution based on a universal set of principles. Hopp refers to argumentation ethics as his greatest intellectual achievement. Murray Rothbard was extremely complimentary as well, so any criticism of Hopp needs to speak of argumentations in some capacity. Since Esso and I are natural rights supporters, there shouldn't be much controversy, right? This single point is solely the reason why Hoppe's approach to the debate of principles and ethics is so seductive to libertarians in particular. The subjects which have caused the most contention within the libertarian movement dating back to the 19th century and even expanding to the present day are the questions of which conceptions within ethical philosophy carry the greatest explanatory power. From what basis does the libertarian philosophy derive its principles? Why does the libertarian truth claim carry such explanatory power? And how does a libertarian necessarily characterize certain concepts, such as political rules? property, or moral agency. A very common attempted refutation which is issued by critics of natural law theories that Hoppe explicitly mentions argumentation ethics is intended to be a response to is to cite an argument known as Hume's guillotine. For those who aren't familiar, the argument more or less goes as follows. Ethical truths and general axiomatic truths don't exist because there's nothing inherent to 
to an ethical claim which determines how someone should or shouldn't act. Simplifying further, I can't say that something ought to or should function a certain way simply because I can define what it is. Of course, this argument as a rebuttal to natural law philosophy has been criticized in numerous different ways by libertarians going back to the libertarian philosophy's early progenitors, mainly because ethical philosophy in general does not inherently assume people are somehow bound to follow ethical truths, and that ethical truth claims assume everyone operates around the same applied moral standards, hence why libertarians are natural law theorists, i.e. their worldview recognizes that conflict disputes can occur. Libertarian philosophy recognizes law to be a general set of conclusions which arise as an emergent property inherent to humans pursuing their own interests within a society to secure their liberty and claim rights. And as such, the libertarian praxis for how one goes about establishing justice for themselves within their community is best articulated by Roderick Long, the pursuit of an equality of authority, which is to say, opposing and seeking to undermine organizations which claim and are able to systematically act upon claims of rights that cannot be defended by any principled, demonstrable means. For example, if there was an island which only two people inhabited, resources were sparse enough that only one of them was able to obtain or make a big stick for themselves that they could use as a blunt object to hunt or craft with, and the other person didn't have such an object, both of these people still have the right to not be aggressed upon, or for the other to claim ownership over them, but if the guy with the stick didn't like something the other said about him, there's very little that the other could do in the way of ensuring that they didn't get aggressed upon or are able to continue speaking. So whether or not one has a right is not at all helpful to ensuring that they can defend their right and vice versa if the other person or organization has the means to consistently aggress upon others to make an income based on this parasitic behavior then they have nothing but incentives to do so and therefore their own morality has no reason to care about whether or not what they're doing is in line with what's ethically true Therefore, although the observation of ethical axioms do not inherently create a reason or disincentive for someone to base their morality around them, or ensure that one can achieve justice in the face of rights violations, obviously if this were true, states wouldn't have ever been able to form in the first place. Libertarians nonetheless have a reason to be concerned about applied morality and how justice is pursued since those are tangentially related to ethical outcomes. The way that the person without the stick could go about solving this problem would be to undermine the inequality of authority which exists between him and his burly friend by, for instance, finding or making an object capable of defending themselves with or a deterrent which could deal as much harm to the guy with the club or collecting a bunch of water and ruining the club if the other person threatens them. Now, Rothbard did quite a few amazing things for the libertarian movement, but he also introduced quite a few narrative black holes into the forefront of libertarian discussion, which libertarians are just now beginning to recover from. One of these was the introduction of the assumption that ethical truths and applied morality are inseparable. In order to have a natural law society, everyone in that society would need to be operating around a single social order, imposed oozed onto the population of said society, because this not only made Hume's guillotine relevant to the libertarian movement, but it also introduced something far worse which we'll be going over in a moment. But anyway, since Hume's guillotine had been made relevant to the debate within libertarian circles, particularly the libertarians introduced to the movement by Rothbard's work and his acolytes, solving the perceived problem raised by critics who cite this argument was important, and finding a rebuttal going forward was seen as necessary in order for the libertarian philosophy to hold true against scrutiny. It became imperative to refute Hume's guillotine by any means necessary and either because the conflict of interest questioning Rothbard would create within the libertarian movement at the time, since this would have been around the time the libertarian 
Libertarian Party was first formed, and creating debate within parties over their platform's overall message is inherently disincentivized by the party model, since political parties rely upon rigid internal centralization, or because people simply never took a step backwards to question whether or not the assumptions made by critics about ethical philosophy was valid, this led to Rothbard's take on natural law needing to be true from the bigger figures in the libertarian movement. This also meant not questioning its conceptual validity. Hence why, as Heretic mentioned earlier, Hoppe merely framing argumentation ethics as a solution to this problem caused it to be held up as a revolutionary expansion upon libertarian philosophy, and Rothbard endlessly showered Hoppe's work with praise. But is argumentation ethics Hoppe's grandest contribution to libertarian philosophy a valid concept? I would say no. A major problem one runs into with this position is that I don't need my body to remain intact in order to argue for or against the concept of self-ownership. And Hoppe's framework doesn't really explain how or why having one's body intact, or what parts of the body remaining intact would be necessary to argue or assume self-ownership. I don't need my fingers, for instance, to argue for self-ownership, so is Hoppe's framework suggesting that I can't defend myself from someone cutting off my fingers? Now, this isn't a new criticism of argumentation ethics. Hoppe himself has rebutted it previously, and his rebuttal mainly consists of attempting to claim that his critics are mischaracterizing his position. His retort goes as follows. Suppose we did have an argument over whether or not I can have your kidney. By having the argument, you would be respecting my bodily integrity, as such saying, I'll cut out your kidney anyway, doesn't work because it destroys the conditions under which it could be argumentatively understood, according to Hoppe. So, the problem here is that he's basing the ownership of one's mouth, lungs, etc. on the person in question's use of them. So at best, he's generalizing something which he hasn't first demonstrated a basis for needing to generalize. In other words, his argument can't be applied universally because there's no cohesive defining trait for why his claim is necessarily accurate as he describes it, and therefore not only fails to defend the assumption that his position was proposed to, but fails as a principle in general. This isn't my only objection or the only objection others have made against argumentation ethics, which I find to be viable criticisms, though. For instance, Hoppe's general philosophical framework doesn't take into consideration the difference between a liberty right and a claim right in its conception. For those who don't know, a liberty right is something that would grant a moral agent the ability to do something. A claim right is something that entails others have obligations, responsibilities, or duties towards me. An example of a liberty right would be the ability to speak or move freely, and an example of a claim right would be compensation for property destruction if another party was responsible, or a resource which one would be entitled to through the exercise of a voluntary association they've made. You can have a liberty right without a claim right. So, for instance, Hobbes thinks that in the state of nature we all have liberty rights to kill one another, but he doesn't think we have claim rights not to be killed. Hoppe claims that the act of trying to justify a theory that rejected libertarian self-ownership is a performative contradiction. The act presupposes the truth of libertarian self-ownership as he explains in The Economics and Ethics of Private Property. According to Hoppe, for the sake of argument, we'll assume the internal reasoning of argumentation ethics is valid, and I accept the claim that by proposing something I inherently take myself to have some sort of rights over myself by the act of merely proposing what I did. I also take you to have some sort of right to control your mind or body under the same criteria.
all I need to avoid a performative contradiction here is for me to have a liberty right to say, I propose something within the internal reasoning of argumentation ethics, but I don't need to have a claim right, since self-ownership inherently consists of liberty rights and claim rights because of associations entitling one to property obtained through voluntary trade, or by creating the resources. Argumentation ethics conflates the two and therefore at best fails to defend it. At worst, it begins to cause such a regress if attempting to argue this from the libertarian perspective that it moves into the realm of unfortunate implications. For instance, would following this line of reasoning mean that I have a claim right to have others believe and think about things the way I argue would be logically consistent for every subject? This actually isn't even that extreme of an example. Hoppians, because of this exact problem with argumentation ethics, regularly argue that acts of aggression against people who hold views they deem to be, quote, subversive to the libertarian social order are justified. If you start questioning the foundational premises and assumptions in conceptualizing subjects, such as property, argumentation, what's necessary to express an argument, or agency from the perspective of trying to justify argumentation ethics, that's where things really begin falling apart. So, according to argumentation ethics, I am no longer a moral agent every time that I fall asleep. What about babies, or, I don't know, low-functioning autistic people? Do they have self-ownership? Also, I find it really amusing how liberally Hoppians ascribe anti-property positions to critics of Hoppe, because argumentation ethics can straight up be used to justify having other people be forced to give you their property. For example, I need to be standing on a patch of ground in order to articulate an argument, and I need food or water in order to survive so I can articulate an argument. Does this mean that I I am entitled to forcibly confiscate land from someone just because I start an argument with them, or force them into labor to provide food for me. Not to mention, as was already established, but I don't think I went into enough detail on this particular aspect of argumentation ethics yet. Argumentation ethics don't even take into consideration basic questions about justice which were already answered by previous libertarians in great detail. For instance, if you do use aggression instead of engaging in argumentation, you'd be implying, according to Hoppe, aggression is a viable means to attain your ends and thus anyone can aggress against you too. Ergo, if you aggress against anyone ever, you forfeit all your rights and no longer can claim to be a victim. Self-ownership can be proven by appealing to the consistency principle, one of the first principles of logic without which science, reason, and evidence would be impossible. The alternative to self-ownership is slavery which violates the consistency principle by arbitrarily deciding which otherwise equal moral agents can or cannot own themselves. Because slavery is inconsistent, it's invalid as an objectively defensible proposition. Because all other options lead to slavery, including nobody owning themselves, everybody owning each other, everybody owning everyone else, and some people owning themselves, it's invalid. Self-ownership is therefore validated by a process of elimination, in addition to its conformity with the consistency principle. It's a completely value-free appeal to logic and the first principles of science alone that demonstrates self-ownership as an is, bypassing Hume's guillotine completely. The only way to get around this is to reject logic, reason, and science entirely. And if you are willing to do that, then, well, we can't have a conversation since you're telling me that you aren't interested in truth at all. Argumentation ethics attempts to solve a problem that's been solved since the days of Aristotle, and in so doing, creates a framework that justifies claim rights to other people's property, while also equivocating acts of aggression like theft, rape, or murder with mere disagreement. As though if you disagree with someone on the price of an apple, you can take them to court for damages.
So, that's argumentation ethics, and already, Hoppe's approach sounds less like a free society where people can associate without being molested and exercise the full extent of their moral agency, and more like a Stalinist dystopia where people are thrown into gulags for thought crimes against the totally not a state community covenant. Oh, and that brings us to the next point of Hoppe's philosophy.